Okay. Um, hi, everyone. This is violist Matthew Littman, and I am really excited to kick off the Violin Channel's VC Heroes series with none other than my personal hero, Heidi Castleman, uh, viola professor extraordinaire. And so, Heidi, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you teach, where you've taught, how long you've been doing it. I teach at the Juilliard School, and I have been teaching for over half a century. And that certainly shows with how amazing you are. Um, I studied with you for, <laughs> let's see, from maybe 2007 until 2014, first at the Perlman Music Program in the summers, mm -hmm. and then at Juilliard for undergrad. And we've kept in close touch ever since, and I'm, I'm so lucky for that. Me too. <laughs> okay, so um, when we talked before, you had mentioned that you have a series of influences that have led you to where you are today as a pedagogue. And I was hoping that you could just um, tell us about those influences before we get into some questions that I have for you, if you don't mind. I would love to. My dream of music and viola started when I was very young. And I lived in an area that was quite rural at the time. And I kept imagining there must be something more out there. So I would listen to music and my very favorite piece was Harold in Italy. I wore that record out. <laughs> so <laughs> I think the dream started because the music took me to a different world. Love that. Who was playing um, in the recording? Carlton Cooley. Oh, wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Awesome. And I think probably the next huge influence on me was Dorothy DeLay. <clears throat> yeah. I had a series of teachers from the time I was four or five. Between then and 12, I had a lot of different teachers. And they had different styles. They had different bow arms. Every other year I would have to change my bow arm. But and it was frustrating, actually, because I didn't feel as if I could make a lot of progress. So when I had the great good fortune to go to Miss DeLay, there were two qualities in her that changed my life. One, I think Gil Shaham said it the best when on CBS Sunday morning, Eugenia Zuckerman asked him, why was Miss DeLay so great? He was quite thoughtful and then he said, because when she looked at you, you played your best. That's very powerful and that was true. Great gift. And the second one, I'll never forget my first lesson. <laughs> Her learning, command of learning sequences was amazing. And one of my many difficulties was shifting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And she said, Oh, sugar, just, just do step one, step two. And it worked. And I went, Oh, there is a path forward here. And I left that lesson saying, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. Powerful. Oh, I bless her. Wow. Actually, but you know, when I think back to your teaching, every time I walked in the room, I was not only nervous, but I felt like I could play my best because of your presence as well. So that's definitely something that you share with the great Dorothy DeLay, so. Thank you. Wonderful. Another 
major influence <clears throat> was my first husband, Charles Castleman. And his path was totally different from mine. He was a child prodigy, uh, a whiz kid. But two things stand out for me that I felt fortunate to be around. One was his first teacher was Emmanuel Andrzejczyk, a great Czech violinist and pedagogue. Every imaginable Sefcik book that existed, he taught. And therefore, I learned through Charlie. So that was wonderful. And the other thing was when Charlie and I started the quartet program together in 1970, I saw how Charlie had this amazing positive attitude toward every student. Thanks. Brilliant talents or not. But he always thought they could learn and was very encouraging. And that's, that's so important. Yeah. Sure. Having started with the opposite kind of teacher at age four, yeah. that was like, <laughs> yeah. I appreciated this. Um, next maybe would be, I went to University of Pennsylvania in their doctoral program because I'm a great believer in history and wanted to know more. So I am ABD. I didn't get my doctorate. I, I wrote three chapters of my dissertation, Berlioz the Critic, no surprise, right? <laughs> um, and it was a beautiful fall day, sunny. And I looked outside. I had just got, arrived at Eastman. And I knew that the director, Bob Freeman, wanted me to teach music history. And I, that was not why I took this degree program. Right. So I went upstairs and I took all my papers and everything, found a nice box, put it in a box, tied it up and took it down to the cellar. And that was the end of my, <laughs> I returned my books. So. Well, you know, it's never too late to uh, finish. <laughs> I think there is some sunset clause there that has passed. <laughs> but I'm not sad because I just love live music and the interaction with people. And that's right. what my heart sing. You wanted to teach viola, not history. I did. I did. Um, another really important influence was a former quartet program student. His name is Mark N. Thacker, and he's a conductor. He's married to actually Victoria Chen. Oh. And he came, he's had the great good fortune to study with Celi Badace, and he came back and he just wanted to tell me everything that he learned. And of course, I was like, okay, <laughs> I want to know. And that was a profound experience for me because fundamental to the way Celbidacci conducted was his belief in the eternal now. He was Buddhist, but he firmly believed that music only exists in the present. So it was against recording, and I share his feeling now that wonderful as it is to have records, that's not the live experience. That's not the real. And I worry about that for our future. But Especially right now, right? Um, during this uh, COVID crisis, yeah. it kind of puts an exclamation mark behind how important live music really is. How yeah. Yeah, so that was very formative for me. And 
just his whole, Chalabadachi's whole way of um, thinking of phrasing as flow of energy, gathering and dissipating. I, I just found it very, very helpful to approach everything that way. Um, so that was I, such a gift. <laughs> the name Leonard Schuer used to evoke total fear and panic in me because I never experienced this with him. He was my colleague at New England and we played, we performed together. But people were terrified of him because it was sort of the old approach of grind the student into the ground so that that will make them stronger. But what I appreciated, he was a Schnabel student and all of his experience and belief in the traditions that flowed, you know, from Beethoven to Czerny to Schnabel, et cetera. And you mentioned Fleischer. Yeah. Um, so I appreciated very much that exposure and that information. And when he first invited me to Nantucket to play with him in this festival, I went with some apprehension, mm -hmm. having heard all these stories. But he was a real, real gentleman. And not as a performer and a colleague, he was not um, terrified. Mm -hmm. so, that was quite wonderful. And he was my colleague also at New England Conservatory. And I, I valued so much, he'd come down the hall and stand outside, they had these big glass windows. And he would just stand outside and wanted to, me to come out so that he could talk. But I learned a lot from him, really a lot. Yeah, this kind of traditional approach, yeah. lineage, etc. And didn't he also teach you to love uh, a certain beverage? <laughs> I hope my family isn't listening. <laughs> he took me out back <laughs> and showed me where his stash of vodka was. Yeah. I, I adore vodka. I don't drink anymore, but I, yeah, that was very nice. <laughs> and I guess the next would be Qigong. And in some ways, that has been my greatest teacher. And I say that because it's about movement. It's about the flow of energy. <clears throat> For musicians, it's about vibration, which is so central to us. It's about stillness. It's about silence. Uh, balance. Living in harmony with nature. And I, since I grew up shunning anything to do with science. I didn't know too much about the forces of the universe, but it's really opened my eyes and being to function, functioning in a way that I think is much more in harmony with music. Amazing. And this is something you've come to kind of recently in your life, right? I think, yeah, very. I would say Earliest was probably 2015, so it's quite recent. Mm -hmm. It's but, cool that it's kind of framed your whole philosophy of music in a new way. That's beautifully said. Yeah, yeah. That's beautifully said. It has. And uh, last but certainly not least, <laughs> my late husband, David Klein, 
was a force of nature. He had a capacity to love people, to love music. He was a physician and a, a computer genius, but his heart belonged to music. And that enthusiasm, that unstoppable force of love really lifted me up and propelled me. And I think the reason I wanted to keep teaching was because both as a doctor and just in his belief in learning, he was, he just thought teaching was the most valuable thing you could do. And it's nice to be with somebody who goes, oh my gosh, what you do is so wonderful. How could you possibly stop? So I haven't. Totally. I, I, he was a force of nature. I was lucky enough to know him for many years. And um, I don't think he came to every Juilliard Studio class, but when he was there, you certainly knew it. <laughs> My favorite story in that regard was, um, he was a great photographer. And he would love to sit in the front row while people were playing and take, he took beautiful photographs. But there was a kind of sound with a click of the camera. And do you remember Gabe Taubman from Google? He's the one who just invented Google Glass. So he very sweetly came in once and presented David with this present of a camera muzzle. <laughs> so <laughs> in the front row, there wouldn't be this loud. <laughs> yeah, I also have so many memories of um going to visit you and him in Sarasota to yeah. get ready for certain uh, projects or competitions. And yeah. yeah, it was fun. He was a great guy. So I think uh, in reflecting on what the largest influences on me, both as a teacher and as a person have been, those are the ones that I, I think of. Thank you for sharing that. That's kind of so amazing. Um, I think everybody listening will love to have gotten to know you. But now, if you don't mind, I have some questions. What? <laughs> About what? Questions that I've always wanted to ask you. So we just paused it, but we're back um, with all the questions uh, that I've ever wanted to know. So um, I totally love studying with you. I personally feel like um, before um, studying with you, I didn't really know what I was doing or how I was doing anything. And then I came to you and actually the first summer, I remember not really understanding much that you were trying to get me to do because I was just not ready yet. But um, I, I totally feel like I, learned how to be an artist because of you. So I just wanted to ask you, um, what are your basic teaching philosophies? Um, how do you get students from student to artist? I know that's so vague, sorry. It's not vague really. For me, whether you do the, this at age four or later, there needs to be schooling in the fundamentals. So in terms of left-hand skills, right-hand skills, in terms of building a foundation of vocabulary, mm -hmm. scales, arpeggios, intervals, chords, atonal, everything. And then you learn them first in the most simple uh, setting, in exercises. And then you go to the next level of complexity in etudes. And then you're ready to look at repertoire. And with the bow arm, it's the same thing. You have to go through, <laughs> Right, sir, or mm -hmm. learn the basic strokes. Um, and 
then you need to explore further how sounds develop. That every sound has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that is what makes a phrase evolve. Wow. So every note has to have a, a path. I totally agree. So I'm trying to think what else I'm forgetting. Um, it, it's interesting um, because if I'm understanding correctly, you're kind of helping your students distill or break down technical elements into their most basic form to understand precisely what's going on technically on a, in, in a deep way, right? Before you go back to say Walton Concerto or something, that way you know you have a foundation so you know how to approach certain technical challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And I, as an example, with bow studies, I'll start out with Kreutzer. I happen to love Sefcik Opus 3, but also Opus 2. But then it's so important to go to something like Tartini, Art of Bowing, mm. or musical context. I remember that. Yeah. And I think with etudes, it's the same thing. That a lot of the road studies will have more musical uh, impetus in them than, say, Kreutzer. Mm. Right. I think there's uh, you can identify a Heidi Kaplan student based on their bow arm. Um, I think, yeah, everybody that I've seen come out of your class has just a beautiful, relaxed, and expressive bow arm, if I could say so myself. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I've never heard anybody talk about bow expression like you do, so it's awesome. Good. Okay, so I also want to know, to anybody who might listen to this, um, what your tips are for practicing. You know, if you're 17 years old and you'd rather play PlayStation, how do you stay motivated? I want to say one more thing about the fundamentals. Okay. And then answer your question. You, and please remind me. I think key to developing consistency is understanding the size unit that you can grasp as a whole. I think one of I think repetition is important, but only the size unit that you can grasp without having to think, mm. repeat it. Sefcik was a genius at making you repeat things. But <clears throat> a lot of what happens is people, for instance, if they're playing a difficult concerto, will play through things, but it, it doesn't stay because they haven't used repetition in a small enough way first. Right. So that's all I wanted to include, because that's a key link from <clears throat> the first stage of practicing to getting so that you can play and not have to think so much. It's interesting, and it's surprisingly difficult, I think, to, to actually do that. Uh, now that I teach a little bit, one thing that I notice nine out of ten students do is if you're, as a teacher, you're asking them to kind of work on this one small technical element, they'll back up like four bars. You know, it's like, it just, you just automatically assume that it's the whole phrase or the big, the big chunk, but you can actually break it down just to that yeah. element. Yeah, important. In response to your question about practicing, I have found that what I call a practice journal is helpful. I actually carry it around with me. Ta-da! Ta <laughs> and this is a way for the student to teach him or herself. Mm -hmm. Each day, they'll put what they wrote, they'll put their ahas, things that they loved, 
hugs, things that were frustrating, when they practice what they're looking forward to. But it's a way of going from one day to the next and uh, helping guide oneself. Mm -hmm. And I, what I like is when they send them to me, and they often do, I can see what needs attention. Right. And I can see what they're handling great. I mean, I, it's so exciting when they go, oh, you know, I couldn't do this, do this octave shifts yesterday, but I thought this and then, yeah. So, uh -huh. yeah. Right. <laughs> um, you also are a believer in taking lesson notes, right? After. Yes, actually my, I have always taken lesson notes on my students. I bless every day uh, my colleague, Sinyun Wong, who came up one day in studio class and said, I think the students should take the lesson notes and send them to the teachers. It's good, very good definitely helps kind of solidify everything that you've learned in that lesson. Sure. Okay. Do you mind if I ask you a few more questions? No, I don't mind. Okay. Um, so I also, one thing that has always struck me about you is that your teaching evolves tremendously based on the student you're actually teaching. Um, it's like you wear many different hats as a pedagogue. So can you speak a little bit, first of all, is that on purpose? And um, if it is, why is that important as a teacher to kind of cater to each um, individual student? Just as in each moment in life is unique, each student is unique. So what might work for somebody else one person won't work for another. <clears throat> One of the, the things I'm curious about in approaching a student is both what their preferred le learning style is and their least preferred. Mm -hmm. They're basically, the oral is their most preferred, their least preferred is uh, kinesthetic or something like that. Then, you know, you can both build on what their strength is, but you can also have them focus on what they, the weak, weakest way of learning is. And all of a sudden, it opens up all sorts of channels. Mm -hmm. Would you ask me the question again? Sure. <laughs> Your teaching evolved, now I'm looking at my notes. Your teaching evolves so much based on the student you're working with. Why is that important to you? I view each student through a lens of what I imagine they would sound like if there were no obstacles, like the whole of the student. So you're listening deeper than what's actually coming out. I guess you could describe it that way. I hadn't thought of that, but I, I do feel as if I can both imagine what they are striving for and also see where the obstacles are. And that gives me the path. Where I should start is to deal with the lar removing the largest obstacle first. And very often, you don't have to go through that many steps if you get the biggest obstacle. Right, so you, so you don't procrastinate with the, uh, the obstacles. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So um, the next question I have is, we touched on it a little bit before with how in the last five years you've um, gotten into Qigong. And I wanted to know specifically how those Eastern philosophies have changed your teaching style. First is that it, they have allowed me to be more objective. I'm basically a very enthusiastic person. <laughs> and uh, this has allowed me to stay in the middle, which ends up making it more about the student and less about me. That's crucial, is that it not be about the teacher. And the other that 
that way in which it's been revolutionary in terms of how I approach things and how directly the student can move in a new way um, is to draw on principles of Qigong in terms of how you use your body, whether it's how you use the bow, how the energy of the hands is connected. Yeah, so often I could go through a million words and steps to get somebody someplace, but if you just follow the image of whatever it is. Yeah. It's a feeling that they can remember. It's not a million words, it's a feeling. Right. There are certain organic, like universal principles that apply to anything, not just viola, right? Yes. So, um, thank you for that. It's, it's interesting to, to, to hear how it, your teaching relates to something that is not even about viola at all. It's something much more universal. But um, when I was studying with you, a word that I remember you used a lot was balance. And I, I wondered if you could just speak to why do we need to be balanced? If I were a physicist, I could probably answer this more succinctly. But it feels to me as if there are forces from above and forces from below that meet in the middle of us. Can you imagine you're chinning yourself? You're pulling yourself up? Right, against gravity. Against gravity, that's part of what you're feeling. And then if you can feel as if your feet are rooted into the ground, like there's something that's pulling you down into the ground, those two forces if they're in balance, one can move effortlessly. But if you're just without that kind of complementary energy, mm. does that? I think so. And I, I, I think it also relates to the quality of sound that I remember you always asking me to look for, which is a, a, a sound that has three dimensions, not just high overtones, not just low overtones, but a sound that kind of blooms naturally with all of them. Yeah. Um, and I, I suppose it's probably directly related to what you were just talking about. I think so. Some, one, a singer once told me that as you move up an interval, you have to, your body has to feel as if you're going down an interval. It's sort of, it's similar to that. Yeah, Sir Isaac Newton, opposites thing. I don't know, I, I, I never took physics. <laughs> I'm not touching that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shall we move on? <laughs> it sounds good. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, okay, the next question is kind of a, a difficult one. How, how has the field changed? Obviously, with the onset of the internet, a lot has changed. Does that affect the values you teach with? What does a modern student have to do that may be different these days than it was 30 years ago? In some ways, I believe you will answer this more persuasively than I, but here's, here are my thoughts. The dangers we are facing in the modern world for classical music, everything is, has become exceedingly high energy, which tends to drown out the more reflective parts of our the human nature. Another major <clears throat> danger I've alluded to before, which is confusing digital reproductions of music as actual music. I believe that Heifetz gave us so much, but the intersection of his incredibly high standard of playing with recording has led people to feel that that's, that level of perfection is 
primary objective or goal. Right. So I think those are two dangers. I heard on a podcast recently a high school student talking about the power of music to help people remain emotionally connected. Yeah. I was touched that she felt expressed it so clearly. I think because music is about vibration, is alive, physical, within us, it touches us on all different levels. There isn't any other art form that does that as completely, as totally. So keeping it alive and significant in our culture is imperative if we're going to stay fully human. How do we have to adapt? I, that's where you come in, in terms of what I love about what you've done is you have the highest, uh, for back up, lack of a better word, classical values that are personified in the way you play. And a totally wonderful, welcoming personality that invites people in. And I think combining that eagerness to reach out to people that you have together with your musical thumbprint <laughs> is the path forward. But I, I think the benefit of having somebody my age still involved is the roots that I have in the past. I love being brought into the present, but I'm not the person who's going to invent the, the future. Uh, so I, somehow to combine what I can bring with what you're discovering and you're doing is I think the best of the worlds that we can merge together. Is that? Yeah, I just, I could listen to you talk all day. I'm so inspired. I also think that during this, uh, the COVID crisis, I think people are sort of realizing actually the importance of not only live concerts, but always feeding the soul. It's so easy to kind of lose sight of, or just not go to the place that great music can take you to. And maybe the one biggest benefit of having to be home is, is being able to go there much more frequently and learning to really cherish that. Yeah. Just, just the other day, I was like sitting in my living room, just listening to late Schubert piano sonatas and like moving myself to tears. And like, when was the last time that happened? I mean, you know, as Schubert, it's like one movement is like 20 minutes long. I don't have the time normally. But it's so important. Yeah. Okay, so to end the, to end the um, heroes interview, I'd love to ask you some uh, rapid fire questions. Okay. Okay. So how have you been spending your time during COVID-19? I've been teaching online at Juilliard students. I've been practicing, I've been doing Qigong, and then staying in touch with family and friends. Important. Oh, yeah. Uh, what's your favorite viola piece? My answer is one phrase. <laughs> <laughs> Schumann, American Builder, last movement, B section. 
And your favorite opera? <laughs> My favorite opera is Figaro. I've had many arguments about this with the Perlmans. <laughs> I believe that Don Giovanni is a much greater opera, but I happen to love Marriage of Figaro. I think I side with you. Okay, and my last question to end this interview is, what's one piece of advice that you would give to aspiring young viola players? I want to say patience, but instead, I'm gonna say love the process. Don't be so outcome oriented. Be more invested in the process and the discovery. And for me, a huge moment of learning was when it occurred to me that <clears throat> making mistakes, failing, are among the greatest teachers one can have. I always felt so crushed. And there, just as the pandemic is an opportunity, mistakes, things that you wish hadn't happened are opportunities. Sage advice. I think if, um, if anybody made it through this interview, yeah. it's very, very clear why um, you're so many people's hero. Um, the wonderful Heidi Castleman, professor of viola at the Juilliard School, um, it's been lovely talking to you, and I am forever grateful um, that I've been able to know you and, and learn from you. So thank you. Well, it's my great pleasure. So thank you. Bye, everyone.